Welcome to Lunchtime with the Masters, brought to you by PICA. I'm your host, Brett Robotsky, and we have the tremendous honor today of having Dr. Larry Domenico with us today. Larry is the residency director and fellowship director in Youngstown, Ohio, a prolific publisher in our profession and a noted expert. Uh, you can't go to a seminar on any high-end surgical technology and Larry's not sharing his knowledge with us. So Larry, welcome to Lunchtime with the Masters. Thank you, Brett. You've been this incredible expert on the lapidus procedure and really have taken that to the next level. I remember seeing your lecture, you don't open up the first MPJ. You don't do anything in the capsule. You don't do anything with a lateral release. Tell me about it. So in my opinion, in my experience, uh, for about the last 17 years, I've been really limited my helix valgus corrections to first MTP fusions and or lapis procedures. And the reason why is the lapis procedure is the only procedure that I'm aware of of all the 130 different listed procedures in the publications that allow you to obtain correction in all three planes, the sagittal plane, the frontal plane, and the transverse plane. And in my opinion, all helix valgus deformities have some form of deformity in all three planes so the root of the pathology is at the first met form joint? Yes, if you think about it, when you look at a virgin bunion, per se, where there's never been any surgery or trauma to it, I've never been able to see a hallux valgus deformity with a first met tarsal that is not straight. So if you inherently sit back and think about it, you have and a the straight... The bone's not curved. Right. So if you inherently sit back and think about it, the first met tarsal straight, so if you look at the other procedures, you're making the bone crooked to get rid of the bunion. And it really makes no sense. If you look at a tarsal metatarsal joint and non-pathological feet, there's very little motion there. So by fusing it or locking it up, you're not causing any significant changes or um, potential ailments for a patient. So you're able to push the bone it. over, straighten out the toe without doing any capsular work. Right. The first metatarsal controls the alignment, getting it realigned and putting it back into anatomical position is the key because nobody's born with a bunion. There are developmental biomechanical faults that develop. The great toe doesn't have a deformity to it unless there's some unusual um, deformity that the patient presents with. But in routine helix valgus deformities, these are malalignment issues and just needs to be realigned. You've also been a proponent of letting people walk on these right after surgery. I know a lot of people have that's always been hesitant, back to the closing base wedges and the elevatus issues. How has it been so successful in your hands? Um, two things, paying attention to detail, knowing your anatomical landmarks, as, uh, and really... But what are you doing specifically? I mean, we'll assume that you shouldn't be operating unless you know your anatomical... But you need, you need to know the anatomical landmarks in detail. Okay. That's a difference. And then you need to know your AO fixation in detail. There's a difference between screws the length of screws you put in, size diameter screw, whether it's solid or where it's cannulated, the pull out strength, whether you're using a plate or not a plate, it's how you apply the fixations. And you're looking for a rigid construct as best as possible. Bigger, longer, broader, um, because ground reactive forces. You have to, you know, my fellow who's an engineer at this time, she put to me this way, after a bridge is built and the concrete hardens, you can still drive on the bridge even though it's just up, been put up for a few days. It's either the contract can hold the weight or it cannot hold the weight. Interesting. So once you're locked, you're locked. And once you do that, I guess you protect them in a boot for a yes. while? And so I've had the experience with lighter, thinner females where I've been able to put them in a tennis shoe two weeks. And believe it or not, from a clinical standpoint, if you think about it, patients do better mentally, physically, less edema. They're using their muscles less chance of DVTs, PEs, less need for physical therapy. It is a form of physical therapy, and they're mobilizing and they're getting around. It just everything in a, in a general sense seems to go better. It's more predictable. Um, <clears throat> and obviously, the key components, I think, are to the surgery is, one, spending most of your time dissecting the joint well, making sure the bone's bleeding, you're past that subchondral bone. And the second thing is your construct. And once you put those two things together, get it anatomically aligned, uh, patients do pretty darn well with these uh, procedures. Well, Larry, it's fascinating. You've been disruptive in you know, technology for our profession. It's, you know, let them walk on it, don't open up the first MPJ, and you're having incredibly great results. So I think that speaks to itself. 
And I would encourage everyone to participate by going to the forum at forum.podiatricsuccess.com and share your opinions with uh, Dr. Domenico. Larry, thank you so much for being part of Lunchtime with the Masters. Thank you. Appreciate it.